Okay, thank you all for sticking around, getting ready for the good session when we get to actually talk amongst ourselves. So I'm actually a, a molecular toxicologist by training. So what I do for a living is try to, uh, to identify biologically active molecules and then understand how they act biologically. And I'm not going to talk about that today. But instead, I'm going to I'm give an example of many of us, we've heard how we stumbled upon the need for nutrition for a number of other drivers. It really wasn't the nutrition question. In most cases, it's just, oh man, we need to consider this. So I think I'm in that um, category as well. Okay, so, our, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience in developing and testing. And, and when I use the word defined diet, Sultan, and I actually really mean a defined diet. And we've actually, and I'm not going to show it today, we've also done complete chemical defined diets. And I will tell you that it was not very successful. We worked on it for about three and a half years. Um, and that was for some SILAC studies we're trying to do for stabilized stone labeling. And uh, we, we just didn't get the recipe yet. So I won't talk about that today. But it, it's still something I think can be done. It's just going to take a little bit more work. So I'm going to talk about some of the challenges with our defined diets and some of the impacts. And then um, another one of the drivers, some of you know this about our lab, is we're really worried about biosecurity for a number of reasons. We're very concerned about the influence of infection on research results. I know that's the topic of a different workshop that that, that this um, institute uh, handles. But but I'm gonna talk about how the selection of the diet really impacts your ability to handle the biosecurity. And that's one of the drivers I'm gonna show you um, and some of the challenges and concern, again, the impacts. And then finally, I'm gonna put a toxicology hat on just for the last slide or two to talk about the uh, really, how do we consider, so Mark talked about uh, a little bit about uh, uh, toxicants. And as a toxicologist, it's just, that was a nice primer, but I mean, it's a massively more complicated than, than what you suggested. So I'll get into that. Uh, so, so why did we want to define a defined? Why did we want to make a defined diet? We actually wanted to develop, evaluate an individual component, and uh, we heard about that today. And one of my papers was highlighted as one of the examples of quote doing it right. That wasn't my doing. That was actually a, a nutritionist, uh, Marette Traber, who's an expert in vitamin E, who who really helped us. So we worked on that for, and we're still working in that area for over a decade. And so what does it take to develop a defined diet where you can actually isolate one component and ask the biological impact or the molecular impact of that? And then, and then uh, some of the challenges operationally, uh, we've talked about this all day today is, you know, what is essential? What is normal? Um, what is optimal? And I would say nature doesn't know this either, right? You know, we want to benchmark it to, we've heard from our aquaculture experts in the room, we want to benchmark it to what they normally eat. Well, they normally eat because what's there? What's there? That hasn't been selected in some top-down <laughs> grand uh, de uh, designer about what a fish needs to optimally uh, uh, survive. And when we think about what we're trying to do, all of us have different experimental objectives, and we now know that the diet influences many of those. And, and uh, Steve mentioned this earlier, there's a massive education uh, effort that needs to happen we're not going to necessarily, at this point, I view, dictate what people should be doing, but they need to understand that diet influences almost everything they measure. And, uh, and, and that is not widely accepted. We saw that in the survey results. Uh, okay, so, um, and then we uh, talked a little, uh, Chris talked about this a little bit as well, the performance of the diets under the conditions that we're constrained with, with our designed efficient systems. See, these re recirculating systems, um, They've certainly massively expanded our capability and our ability to do more experiments, house more animals and more types of animals. Uh, but they come with certain um, uh, uh, features that that really can uh, fight against you when you're trying to modify your diet uh, formulations. Uh, so we we play around a lot with the formulations and buoyancy in, in a very systematic way. We have our own diet kitchens and um, and there's a lot of work that can be done in this area still. But as you know, no one's really funded to do any of this. So it's all kind of done just out of a, as a hobbyist, <laughs> per se. So for the first diet that I'm going to describe, I'm not going to go into great details, but we did carefully uh, go through and try to identify not only the, the from the literature, from a lot of the aquaculture literature and some of the rainbow trout work that was done in the building that I direct now, um, and really try to adapt it to zebrafish. But importantly, identifying sources and then the purity of those sources, I can't emphasize it enough from a toxicologist how important it is to, to have a control over the, the quality, the stability, the lability, the storage half-life of everything. Because every, you mean, it's in the diet because it's, it's essential, but that means it has to be there. 
So if you have batch to batch variation, you don't have control of your diet. If you have a, a labile ingredient, we have examples where we make defined diets and we're asking for a, a component. We'll, we'll get a message like, yeah, this only has a six month half-life. Okay, great. And then we order it at you know January and we'll order it again in June and we get the same batch with the same lot number. Okay, thank you. So that means you shipped us at least at one expiration and maybe a hundred expiration days. Is it labile or not? And if you do not measure and nobody wants to do that. Nobody can do that to measure the constituents and their integrity or their purity over time. That's really not what any of us are really um, trained or, or really want to do. And then so we and then so making the mineral mixes and defining those, and then the vitamin mixes that defining those. So this is what we we worked on for a number of years. And just a, again, I'll go back real quick. The uh, the protein sources uh, we have. I can't go back. It's stuck. Um, we're stuck. Well, we're, we're dead. Do I have to escape out? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, good. So we have various diets where we have egg white and the, as our main protein source, and then we have casein as another source. And again, like we were earlier, some of those sources actually could have variations as well if you're not, if you don't uh, quantify them. All right, so that so when we started developing these diets, this was the first control um, experiment that we tried to do. We wanted to take uh, one point. I want to point out I, we use this um, uh, wild type strain uh, that I developed uh, over a decade ago now, which its intent was to have a diverse diversity in the genetic stock. And this this has a significantly higher diversity of, of the, some of the more inbred uh, strains that are commonly used. And we've se recently sequenced his genome and, and demonstrated that diversity. So our population is more diverse than, than most. Um, and we use that for some screening purposes. That's why we did it. So we, we got large populations of these fish and then we uh, split them up in. Um, and one thing you'll notice that we're waiting at one month of age. We didn't want to do this. So we made a defined diet. We wanted to feed these guys right after they start feeding at five or six days. And this diet was not sufficient to accomplish that. So right out of the gate, we could not isolate the vitamin E because we couldn't, the fish were not, they didn't like the taste, it didn't, didn't look right. Um, so we figured out that about 30 days um, into life, we can shift them over to this diet and then they, then they would thrive on it. So even in our, a lot of effort, we still haven't solved that first part. So that's also gonna delay our studies. So vitamin E, as you know, is a lipophilic component. So this, it takes time to get it in and it also takes time to deplete it. So we had to calculate those depletion kinetics. So then we, we feed them and then um, at about three months of age, we start the spawning. And on the bottom, you see some, some initial experiments to see, well, how is this diet doing, right? So we looked at um, when the, after the embryos are, um, are, are collected, we, we plate them, we do everything in, in an automated uh, environment. So we plate them in an I6-well plate, we assess a number of automated uh, morphological features. And then in this case, uh, we collected RNA at the 36 hour time point, and then we observed phenotypes up until, um, uh, up until the end. And so, the, so we collect a massive amount of data of every individual embryo that came from parents that were fed these diets. And just, uh, it's not important to look at the top, but basically we look at the bottom, um, the uh, affected individuals. So you can see the animals that are um, uh, our E minus diet, even at 24 hours, you start seeing some um, uh, effects on the embryo and that increases uh, to a very high percentage and like 75, 80% are, are, are dead or arrested development by uh, 72 hours. And in our E sufficient, so our defined diet that we supplemented with ethyl tocopherol, um, they, they're okay, but you can notice it's, it's, it's higher than background. So these guys were affected. Um, these fish are not completely uh, normal. And but this is here just to demonstrate the E deficiency. So we were able to deplete. So we have to, we deplete the parents, right? We, we can't feed the embryos yet because they're not eating. So we feed the parents for um, at three or two months, up to three months of age. And then the embry embryos that are produced are massively deficient in vitamin E. And that deficiency is leading to these uh, developmental um, uh, consequences. So that was kind of the experimental system. We worked with this for a number of years. Um, we, so we, I won't talk a lot about gene expression, but this is just a, a first peak. So when the animals are indistinguishable from each other, the E sufficient, E uh, deficient in our laboratory uh, uh, di diet, we just sample embryos and do full embryonic uh, RNA sequencing at a very deep level, a uh, very deep, deep uh, sequence number. 
And what we see, this is what lots of ways to look at it, but we compared all of the, the diets to the E, um, the e plus. So you can see in the, the lab diet compared to the defined diet that has enough vitamin E, there's still hundreds of gene expression changes. Um, and, and this is a, from a n- number of pooled um, uh, replicates. And then if you actually look at the E minus, it's even greater. So the E, e deficiency in combination um, with the defined diet has a massive impact on, on expression. So, so again, it's not that uh, your individual gene might be affected, but the point is that there are a lot of uh, networks that are impacted. And the potential crosstalk of these disruptions just by the diet could influence your interpretation of your experimental results if you're taking a molecular approach. Um, so I just want to, I brought this up recently. So we heard earlier, so the, I, I actually run the Sin Huber Aquatic Research Laboratory, which has a long history in developing rainbow trout diets. And uh, it's very different now. So this entire 18,000 square foot facility was all rainbow trout aquaculture and cancer studies. And so I actually named the, the lab when I took over the directorship about 15 years ago in honor of Russ Sinhuber, who actually um, uh, developed the trout diets that was talked about earlier today. Um, so what reason I bring, gonna bring it up is it's not only it's a huge facility, we have four zebrafish rooms, we have a, a quarantine room, but we also have a specific pathogen-free environment in about 70% of the, the working area of the lab. So that means we want to control everything that gets in, and then we want to make sure that we're not you know, introducing disease into our system. And um, so that, that actually creates a, a lot of challenges. So, so what is it? So we, it's, it's uh, initially just specific pathogen for pseudoloma. Uh, so again, we instituted over a decade ago, a, a strict biosecurity program. So we need it massive for the high throughput screening part of my lab. Uh, we need 10 to 80,000 embryos every single day. And, and that's Monday through Friday, uh, and then some on Saturday and Sunday as well. Um, so we have a lot of experience in, in doing feeding studies and and I'm always trying to drive, many of you are doing the same thing, drive labor costs down. So that was a main driver for, for me is to get the labor cost down. Um, so we removed the small live feed. So this is over in 2010, we stopped feeding paramecium and rotifer for the little, the little fish. Uh, and this was for a number of reasons, there's biosecurity uh, problems that are well understood by many, and then also the labor involved. Uh, so we wanted to get rid of that. So we, we have successfully done that for eight years now. Um, but then, and then the, um, but what we tried to remove Artemia with our traditional commercial diets, it was not successful. So that combination of pulling the Artemia and then going to that uh, flake diet um, was not successful. So we said, let's try again. Uh, so what, so again, the Artemia, why are we worried about Artemia? Many of you know this, the quality varies, the cost varies, the shortages are a problem, massive problem for biosecurity uh, breaches, you, it, it's not sterile, um, but worse than that is in terms of a toxicant load. So we've measured a number of batches and uh, mercury as one example, because these are collected in open environments. So the mercury load at, although a lot, lot, low concentration bioaccumulates, so uh, that's a concern for us. And then also just having so many components uh, entering our system. We wanted to clean that up. So the commercial diets, they um, there's been issues with inconsistency. I know um, others have noticed uh, feathers showing up in your in your diets and um, clumps of other food, plastic. So just uh, seems to be a less uh, control over uh, quality assurance in this in this sector. Um, it's gotten better. Um, so then it would be arriving again weeks after the expiration date. That's really helpful, um, particularly when you have a, your animal care inspectors look at your food and say, oh, this is brand new, but it's expired. So then we get slapped. Um, um, so again, relying on mix of feeds um, are often the case. We've heard examples of that today. Um, so, so this first study goal was um, the second one. Could we completely remove our chemia from our program if we changed our defined diet? And then again, that would minimize our biosecurity challenges minimize labor costs, and hopefully maintain or improve our embryo production. So right now, my driver, and I know it's different for many of you, is to, to achieve all of these. Better, faster, cheaper, lots of eggs, and get them fast and, and high quality. So that's what we want to see. Could we achieve that? Um, okay, there we go. There you go. Come on. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so in our first initial trial, we tried the... Um, our controlled diet, which was a Ziegler AP1000 Golden Pearl with Artemia, and then we, uh, which we've heard a lot about, the Gemma uh, Micro, and then we had the Ziegler uh, with Artemia, and then uh, uh, Ziegler alone. So we tried these combinations, just an initial, fairly large trial to see how did these, how did they perform in terms of viability in egg production. 
What's going on? Um, so again, the idea was these guys we can feed right away. So right when they, they start eating, we can um, track survival be, beginning at 30 days and then at 90 days. And then we would uh, spawn the fish at intervals at 10 or 14 days and do a cumulative count. So we're getting a count and a quality score. I'm not gonna show you the quality score here and see how they did. And so in this first trial, um, you can see that of the, I uh, labeled them, the, the Gemma uh, outperformed our, our, our traditional uh, lab diet and the AP 100 plus, and then with Artemia and minus were the, the least performing. So, so we, we already had a hint that the Gemma in our, for our drivers was actually gonna perform better for, for our needs. So, so what we did is we repeated these studies with those two diets, our control diet, diet and the Gemma uh, plus and minus Artemia and just uh, uh, did the rest of studies. You can see that in terms of the viability at 83 and, um, and um, approximately 80% in the controls and where um, it starts dropping in these other diets. And then just kind of shows you, this is three replicates, a very large uh, uh, group. So a 30 and fit, a 90 day survival in the control um, and, and, the, and the Gemma diet. And you can see that the, the Gemma is, I mean, they're close, but the Gemma is outperforming it certainly in the 90 day uh, time point. So uh, these are, are, are pretty good results for us that, that would meet our criteria. And then, then we wanted to do large fecundity studies. So well, since we do large production, we, we don't do a lot of little spawning tanks. We have large 100 gallon tanks. We have 35 gallon tanks. So we, we can collect lots of eggs very quickly. So in this example, we have three, 375 liter tanks with about 900 fish, uh, a one to one ratio. And this one, we have 150 fish, uh, 150 liters and 400 fish. And then we, these are what I'm gonna de describe two different groups. And then what we're gonna do, we're gonna count the, the quality and the number of eggs. And so we, we group spawn them, and this is kind of a cumulative. So when you get this many eggs, you don't really count anymore, although we have an automated counter now. Um, but we did this, we didn't. So it's actually done by mass and you divide, divide it. Um, so you can see that um, in the, the lab diet, and we have pretty good production with 207,000 uh, eggs uh, cumulatively, but even the, uh, the Gemma did better, like 250,000. And then uh, fish group three was, um, again, the smaller uh, set of fish. Uh, fewer eggs, but still the Gemma outperformed it. So, so we were, for our, our production needs, this one did really well. And then if you start tracking, again, we need big, big batches. So you start tracking over time, every time you do these spawns. Um, our, our lab diet, which we use for a long period of time, produced less embryos, took longer to achieve numbers over 5,000 uh, eggs in a spawn, and then fewer spawns greater than 10,000 embryos. So everything with the Gemma is shifted up. So uh, I'm in looking at a better, better production. And then we start, and then of course, looking at the adults, and we, we'd we have some histopathology on a lot of these um, that Mike Kent does for us, but you can even look in the weight gain for uh, the, the females and the males um, uh, when you compare the, the control diet uh, versus the, the Gemma. So the, the Gemmas are getting bigger, like we heard in many of the other talks today, uh, and they get they get longer as well. And then, and then if you actually look at, um, if you start looking at a K factor, again, the Gemma diet produces females with a higher body condition factor um, than the males, just marginally better. So, so again, the Gemma seems like these fish are growing better and they produce better or more eggs and, and high quality eggs. So the study outcomes, we want to know, could we remove Artemia um, without additional live foods? And yes, we can, and under, again, our conditions. Um, we want to minimize potential biosecurity, so we reduced our incoming stuff by, you know, five to one. Um, and then uh, eliminated hundreds of staff hours in, in making live food and maintaining it, and, and again, cost. And then finally, maintain or improve existing survival. So again, for our metrics, we have more eggs, higher quality eggs, um, consistently with the, with the Gemma uh, diet. So the last thing I told you I'm gonna talk about the very last slide is um, the toxicant load. How do you define your toxicants? So um, the problem is, is uh, there are some really bad actors that many of us have identified in the literature, you know, high loads of copper are very bad for aquatic organisms. Example, mercury, we heard about uh, arsenic, um, lead, et cetera. So it's actually easy to measure those. You can do on a single run in an ICPMS and very quantitative numbers. And there, there, there are um, formulas and models to calculate what the bioaccumulation would be. That's actually pretty easy. Um, so that's not a problem. So you should be able to, if you're designing um, um, 
uh, diets, commercially, you should be able to source components where you keep those levels down. That's actually very easy. The tougher one is the rest of the chemical universe. That's where I work in. And um, many, so we've screened hundreds of thousands of chemicals specifically to identify chemicals that modulate um, developmental progression or developmental events. So, so we have a better understanding of how many can do that. And, um, and so you start thinking of pesticides. Pesticides are, are, quote, residues in many of these compounds. Some of these are actually bioaccumulate um, plastic comp components. We've heard about a little bit of that, bisphenol A, phthalates. And you start thinking about industrial chemicals and uh, uh, polyalkyl substitutes, flame retardants, PCBs, pHs, dioxin. So these things are, are particularly important because they bioaccumulate and they're active at really low concentrations. So they, they may not notice it in, in a, even for a couple um, generations, but these things are accumulating in your in your system. And so what I mean by that, so if you have these uh, hydrophobic compounds in a diet can bioaccumulate, even if they're at really low levels, particularly if you have these long-term studies that we, we heard about. And again, the chemical properties, which you can predict fairly well, influence the degree of uptake or accumulation. Again, there are models to predict that. So if you use the log KOW ratio, so if you have a, lot, long, uh, a high log KOW, those are compounds that tend to get into the lipids. That means if they are in the diet, they'll accumulate, and then they'll accumulate the, into, the, into the yolk. Um, so the last point I really want to make is for, for compounds that are delivered either like a Mark, uh, a Mark was saying earlier, you, a lot of these studies are done by adding the chemicals to the water. That's actually okay because some of these compounds partition from the water to the yolk really fast. I'm talking within minutes. So it's almost as if you got it from a paternal load into the yolk. It's not the same if there's metabolism. But the point is that um, the parents, what they eat, and we've measured a lot of these, they really are loading the cargo, the yolk that's going to be the, the building blocks to build all those developing uh, systems that we're all trying to study in zebrafish are going to be influenced by those accumulative accumulations in the cargo. And so I think we're at a better stage to start increasing what chemicals we should be looking at to see whether or not they are entering into our, into our diets and therefore our systems. Um, and just one example from the literature, an example um, uh, from that group that I, I don't, don't know that group, but they showed that accumulation of mercury just by the number of days at these low levels of mercury in the diet, and they accumulate at fairly high levels. And when you remove it from the, the diet, it still takes a fair amount of time for it to be uh, removed. And then uh, a paper from uh, the Mike Carvin's lab recently demonstrated that uh, very low levels of mercury uh, epigenetically modified the embryo and affects behavior in like four generations. So these are things you, you, we talked a little bit about in here about epigenetics, but um, identifying chemicals that have the propensity to modulate the machinery that affects epigenetics should be, a, in my view, a, a priority. And, and those are not well understood in any system. All right, with that, I'll, I'll shut up. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the advice I got from the nutritionist, but secondly, the, um, we were able to confirm that they were fairly clean. So there were other protein sources that we were considering, but also the way they behaved in the waterfall, those, those combinations were